like any other production and service system at CSUN, we have inputs in terms of freshmen and transfer students. We have resources, human resources and capital resources like professors, teacher assistants and advisors and administrators. Capital resources such as classrooms, computers and so on. We have a network of value added and non-value added activities like classrooms and waiting lines in front of the professor's door or in front of tier rooms. We have a value system like the student center learning environment system that we have at CSUN and an information infrastructure like our grading system and our transcripts. And finally, we produce output, which are uh, graduates and dropouts. Any system, including uh, CSUN, should have a reasonable financial performance and value chain performance. In this direction, the institute should satisfy its customers as well as its stakeholders. It should understand their, their perceptions and expectations. In all manufacturing and service systems, including CSUN, will propose a customer value proposition to their customers and they develop process competencies to be able to deliver that customer value proposition. The customer value proposition is usually defined in four dimensional space of cost, quality, time, and variety. That is the four dimensional space of customer value proposition which should be matched with four dimensions of process competencies. Process competencies are cost, quality, flow time, and flexibility. We first take a look at cost and then quality to cost. After that, we will go and look at the other dimensions. Obviously, we all know that CSUN is doing great in cost dimension in spite of recent significant changes in tuitions. This data I have collected it over a period of five, six years. I have asked about 1,000 students what is their perception about Stanford, Berkeley, USC, Pepperdine, Lutheran University, and CSUN. And this is the score the students have provided uh, in a scale of 0 to 6. As we see, CSUN is not in a bad position. By the way, when I have asked our student to rank these six institutes, the way they have instituted themselves was lower than when I have asked other people in other institutes to evaluate our students compared to those other five institutes. Frankly, I have asked almost everyone about what they think regarding performance of our students compared to the other institutes. So now if I go ahead and draw that understanding on 
vertical axis and score these six institutes from zero to six and if on the horizontal dimension I draw the cost and cost is not good because here in vertical axis I get better if I'm getting away from the origin but in cost dimension I'm not getting better when I move from the origin indeed cost increases therefore on this dimension instead of cost I prefer to put cost efficiency, which is defined by one divided by cost. And here I have assumed the tuition of the most expensive university is 36,000 per year. Of course, it is higher than that. Therefore, in the numerator, I have put 36,000 and the denominator I have put the cost of that institute. Therefore, for example, if Stanford has a cost of 36,000, its cost efficiency comes out to one, but if CSUN has a cost of 6,000, its cost efficiency comes out six. Therefore, I will have, for example, CSUN here, while Stanford is around here. Now let's look at this quality to cost efficiency graph. For example, here is Institute L, which has a low quality and the medium cost efficiency. This is Institute P, which has medium quality and low cost efficiency is expensive. Institute C a little bit better quality compared to P, but also less cost efficiency, more expensive. Institute B, this is a world-class organization. Firms operating on efficient frontier they are world-class organizations. When you are not on efficient frontier, you can improve your situation in both dimensions of cost efficiency and quality. But on efficient frontier, if you want to improve quality, you need to sacrifice cost efficiency and vice versa. In other words, you can improve when you are on efficient frontier only due to outbreaks in something, either in cost saving or in technology or uh, quality improvement. So we have a couple of institutes here on the quality and cost efficiency dimensions here in Institute S, also on the efficient frontier, very high cost institution and at the same time extremely high quality institution and the data that I have collected from maybe close to 800 of our students and the data that I have collected from students of other institutes and my friends who teach in other institutes, they all together indicate that in quality dimension season is somewhere here. Now let's see what this curve means. This institute on cost dimension is average. It has such a measurement in one over cost and as we said 36,000 over cost or we can call it K over cost and in this dimension it is quality so if I am looking for quality to cost 
if I'm going to move from two dimensional space of quality and cost to one dimensional space of in this dimension I have one over cost in this dimension I have quality it is enough to multiply them by each other what that multiplication means it means just compute this rectangle this is one over cost this is quality if you multiply this edge by this edge you get the area and this area is quality divided by cost now let's look at season a very big rectangle only institute B in cost to quality dimension could compete with CSUN. CSUN is doing excellent. CSUN is great in quality to cost. Indeed, I believe if we really could get objective data on this quality dimension, and then divide it by cost, CSUN would be definitely among 5% top institutes in the nation. David Nazarian College of Business and Economics is doing perfect in one dimensional space of quality to cost. So, College of Business and Economics for success needs to have a reasonable value chain and financial performance. If we have a good value chain performance, hopefully it will lead to student success and our stakeholders satisfaction. We have proposed something to our students that is what we call it season value proposition and we need to develop resources and learning processes and in general process competencies to be able to deliver this student value proposition what we have proposed to our students perceptions and expectation between this side and this side should we also align in that case, then we can compete in a four-dimensional space of quality of education, tuition, number and variety of classes and courses, and time to graduation, where time to graduation by itself is a function of headcount and the number of incoming students and the number of graduates input and output according to the Lido's law throughput times flow time is equal to inventory average of incoming and graduates each year times the time to graduation is equal to headcount of student here we look at 16 years performance of college of business and economics and as we see here, these are our, all our graduates are this curve. All our incoming students are on this curve. This red curve is unfortunately our dropouts over these 16 years. This negative dropout means some of the dropout of previous years have come back and this one shows the maximum number of dropout and here is inventory of college of business and economy that is in Lidl's terminology and in our terminology that is our headcount average headcount over past 16 years is 6222 incoming per year 
1,653 graduate average per year in the past 16 years, 1,348 and dropout per year, 226. Here is six period moving average of incoming students, graduates, and dropouts. As we see, this is the gap. Now, if we apply the leader's law on the information we have, we come out with these two curves. The red curve is for first time freshmen. The blue curve is for first time transfer. We have had headcount, we have had incoming, we have had graduates. I have estimated time to graduation using the leader's law. This time to graduation have not been computed by going into one by one of student and compute the average. We have had headcount, we have had incoming, we have had graduates, and then we can say throughput times flow time is equal to inventory, and flow time is time to graduation. Average time to graduation for our first time freshmen was 7.7 .7 for first time transfer is 3.5 and these two numbers are 95% confidence interval for both groups. Average flow time of transfer student is less than half of the average flow time or time to graduation for our first time freshmen. This is a little bit counterintuitive because when I first approached this problem, what I had in mind was those who first come to CSUN are better prepared in high school. Then when I looked at the data, I realized that at least in the past 16 years, it was not correct. And therefore, because it takes freshman students more time to get graduated, more than double of transfer students. Or while the ratio of incoming freshmen to incoming transfer goes down over time, but the headcount of those who have come to CSUN as freshmen divided by those who have come to CSUN as transfer continually goes up. That may help us to Look at the best practices of transfer students and try to advertise them to our freshman students. I will go through one or two of these practices later. We realize that we are doing perfect in quality to cost, in quality of education to tuition, but when we transfer that space to quality, to cost, to time, situation is not as good. Indeed, if our graduates spend two years more than what it should be, then we can say that their cost goes up 50%. And if the denominator goes up by 50%, the whole numerator divided by denominator will reduce to two-thirds. Now, if we assume that in that two years which the students are paying tuition at season, they could have worked elsewhere and they have, could have earned as much as their tuition, then the situation at CSUN in the space of quality to cost to time would be even worse. Now if we assume the student could have additional income three times her tuition and that's not too much because tuition is 6,000 if you have a bachelor degree from CSUN getting three times a bit, which would be 18, plus itself, 24, getting 24,000 per year is not too much. And then the rectangle would have changed to this. And if we go to the same competition space, but here we have changed the horizontal line to quality time cost efficiency, then performance of our college, CSUN and CSU, is not good at all. The, the rectangle has profoundly changed. In that situation, we could have ranked ourselves among top 3% of the educational institutes in the nation. 
this one is not so bright now if we add a fourth dimension of variety in customer value proposition and the flexibility in our process competencies then the situation gets even worse we don't offer enough elective course core course in many hours during the day and minutes all days during the week and the worst situation is we even do not offer a capacity equal to the available demand now situation really needs to be considered and something should be done about it we also use the insights we have got from uh, optimization and especially from linear programming to understand the concept of binding constraints what are the binding constraint and which binding constraint has the highest shadow price we cannot mathematically implement it but conceptually yeah we need to think about it find the binding constraints subordinate everything to that binding constraint exploit the binding constraint and try to relax it. these are many solutions that i have observed in the past three years and in this direction we really need to be very careful we need to look at the total system In the 1950s, the Dayak people of Borneo, an island in Southeast Asia, were suffering from an outbreak of malaria, so they called the World Health Organization for help. The World Health Organization had a ready-made solution, which was to spray copious amounts of DDT around the island. With the application of DDT, the mosquitoes that carried the malaria were knocked down, and so was the malaria. There were some interesting side effects, though. The first was that the roofs of people's houses began to collapse on their heads. Turns out the DDT not only killed off the malaria-carrying mosquitoes, but it also killed a species of parasitic wasp that had controlled a population of thatch-eating caterpillars. Thatch being what the roofs of the Dayak people's homes were made from. Without the wasps, the caterpillars multiplied and flourished and began munching their way through the villagers' roofs. That was just the beginning. The DDT affected a lot of the island's other insects, which were eaten by the resident population of small lizards called geckos. The biological half-life of DDT is around 8 years, so animals like geckos do not metabolize it very fast. It stays in their system for a long time. Over time, the geckos began to accumulate pretty high levels of DDT, and while they tolerated the DDT fairly well, the island's resident cats, which dined on the geckos, did not. The cats ate the geckos, and the DDT contained in the geckos killed the cats. With the cats gone, the island's population of rats came out to play. We all know what happens when rats multiply and flourish. Pretty soon the Dayak people were back on the phone to the World Health Organization, only this time it wasn't malaria that was the problem. It was the plague and the destruction of their grain stores, both of which were caused by the overpopulation of rats. This time though, the World Health Organization didn't have a ready-made solution and had to invent one. What did they do? They decided to parachute live cats into Borneo. Operation Cat Drop occurred courtesy of the Royal Air Force and eventually stabilized the situation. I have looked at 16 years of data. Here is 2001. In 2001, this is the populations who were in CSUN for the first year, not in CSUN, in College of Business, for the second year. And this is the number of students who have been in College of Business in the year 2001 for 10 years. Now, if I go to 2002 and look at 
those people who have been in season for two years, then I get these numbers. And of course, these 422 are those 576, and the rest have dropped up. So if I continue on the diagonal, this is the population of 2001 College of Business entering student through an 11-year period. I can do the same for 2002 and move on the diagonal and see what has happened to them and 2003 and so forth. And then I can create this table. So this is what has happened to 2001 students. And if you see that at 11th point, the curve a little bit goes up, it is because after 11 years, some people have come back, some of the drop up have come back. This is 2002, 2003, 2004, 5, 6. And this is all the 16 years. I have the average over there. These are the maximums and these are the minimums. Obviously, in the first four years, we want this curve as flat as possible. And after that, we really like to have a very sharp slope. This is the same thing with 95% confidence interval. So these are the maximums, these are the minimums. Here we like the maximums, here we like the minimum. These are 2015 entering students, freshman students. So they are above the average, it is good. And these are 2014 and these are 2013 first time freshmen at College of Business and Economics and all of them are above the average. So things are a little bit getting better here. Here is the number of graduates we need to follow a specific time to graduation. The black dots we see are our position in the past 16 years. The blue line is the required number of graduates to meet an average of seven year time to graduation. As we see in 2016, we are around there, a little bit even better. In some years, in the past 16 years, we were below average of seven year time to graduation. In some years, we were above. If you are looking for a five-year average time to graduation, then at the current headcount of College of Business and Economics, we need about 700 graduates per year. These are the same numbers, but I have translated them into percentage increase compared to our current position. And this is six-year moving average of these numbers or an exponential smoothing up about alpha equal 0.3. Therefore, in the current position in 2016, this is our current situation, which is more or less about a seven year average time to graduation. We need about 20% increase if you wanna go for six years time to graduation about 45 to 50 percent increase if you want to go for an average of five years time to graduation and about 75 percent increase in our current number of graduates if you want to go for four years time to graduation about 75% increase in this number. I have partitioned our lower division courses and core courses into three groups. Those with high taste of quantitative, those with high qualitative taste, and those in between. So here are before gateway classes, I have defined gateway 
as a milestone to check what has happened and foresee what will happen. But in each of these periods, we implement quantitative tools to see what we think we will be in future. This will be applied to um, groups of students. We can look at it at a very macro level or we can go down and look at it at very micro level. We try to implement descriptive analytics. Descriptive analytics is to understand what has happened in the past 16 years and that is mainly to transform data into information. Then we try to do diagnostic analytics to find the root and effect analysis, why it happened, and that is indeed transformation of information into knowledge. Then we conduct predictive analytics and we try to foresee what is likely to happen and that is mainly transformation of knowledge into understanding. Finally, we try to develop prescriptive analytic models and to learn what should we do about it and it is mainly hopefully transformation of understanding into wisdom. We try to use tools such as Excel, Tableau. Tableau is not analytical tool. Tableau is visualization tool, presentation tool. But we also use Jump, which is more analytical tool, and also we will use frontline solver in this process. So we talked about one of our teachers, John Liddell, and we use the process flow concept to understand the uh, flow. We talked about uh, another teacher, George B. Danzig, which using his concepts in linear programming, we will try to find out what binding constraints have the highest shadow prices and try to uh, understand them, exploit. Now we talk about our other teacher who tries to tell us to have a system view. Mm -hmm.